know, this was all training. Like I was, I was constantly being trained. In the dancing, I was constantly being in my body. Like I was being trained how to be in my body, how to move my body, how to live into my body, how to express my Life's a short and precious thing. Sweet like honey and it sure can sting. Sure can sting. Today I'm very excited to have Angie Rivera here. She is the owner and founder of Aura Healing and the work that she does is transformational. I'm a personal client and I know I have had so many other people referred there because of the work that you did with me that really changed the trajectory of how I saw myself as a woman. Um, and But Angie is so many more things than just that and we're gonna dive into that today because this focuses on the obstacles and occupations of women. And so Angie, let's start with your job, your okay. occupation. What I do is I rebirth women. I help women deconstruct all the things that they've been conditioned to live into instead of living into themselves. So, and these conditions come from society, parenting, religion, you know, the invisible they, the, the, this invisible book of they that, you know, all these rules that women are supposed to follow, but they don't really know why. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's deconstructing all of that and then going a little bit deeper into figuring out all the traumas that are sitting beneath the surface that women tend to spend a lot of time running away from. So this is where like the busy, like the badge of honor of busy comes in. Mm -hmm. It's like taking that out of the equation so that women can start to see the things that they may not even know that they're running away from. They're the missing link in their life. And they spend all this time trying to fill this like void that they're feeling with these exterior factors, the house, the car, the kids, the clothes, the titles. Uh, but there's, there's still going to be that longing. And until they really get back to who they are as women, that longing is going to continue to exist. Mm. So there's never going to be a Band-Aid big enough to soothe that void. I understand your work um, through the treatment I got, which was womb healing. How do you rebirth women? What are the different vehicles you use to rebirth women? Everybody heals in a different way. The body holds on to a lot of these things physically. Mm. And when women talk about their womb, they do associate it with birth. But really the womb for women is their actual heart. This is, this is where we feel everything. Mm. And then your actual heart is your functional heart. And when they go and they start, you know, pushing down these feelings because they don't have time to fall apart, the womb is where all of that goes. So going into the womb, touching the womb itself really brings up a lot for women because, you know, it's an uncomfortable space for women to be touched. And that's the reason why, because we hold all of these things so sacred and it's vulnerable and it's, you know, it doesn't feel good. You know, that's that's what we're wanting to pull out in this womb healing. And it can come through the manual touch. It can come through, you know, talking them through how to peel back the layers. And because everybody does it differently, the energy is going to feel different. You know, what I do is I use the energy that they've been hiding from and I use my energy to pull that out mm -hmm. and bring it to the surface so that they can finally face it, heal from it, and be able to use it as a source of power instead of a source of pain. And the energy that you talk about, some people will look at that and be woo about it, you know? Right. <laughs> They'll be put yeah. off by energy. Um, you know, and I always think about the Karate Kid where Mr. Miyagi would warm his hands up and touch hands on, yeah. you know, um, on the Karate Kid. But it truly is an energy transfer. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so fascinating where you get your... Um, your story of that energy healing and right. that work. Talk about where your in your DNA comes <laughs> from being a true energy healer, being a true healer. So I am Arawak, as some people know it as Taino, and it's Puerto Rican Indian, it's really Caribbean Indian. And um, that's where my lineage comes from. You know, I come from a long line of island midwives, medicine women, um, some people may call them shamans. And really through all of the hand down of information and all of the like lineage and pass on of how the healing happens, how do you, you know, harness. When I go into session, that they're who I'm pulling from. You know, they're the, they're the people who stand by my side as I work. You know, I call to them, they come to me. And my great grandmother was the last in the lineage and she's who I got that from. My grandmother and my mom chose not to walk that path and that's okay. I get the honor of doing that. Um, and a lot of times, you know, when I tell people that I'm Taino, you know, there's this common, you know, misconception that that they've been eradicated, they don't exist anymore. But I find that it's my job to keep that lineage going. You know, I have the backing, I have the family, I have the lineage, I have the medicine, it's sitting right there for me. And I get to use all of that in a beautiful way to help heal the women in my community so that they can be the catalyst to heal the women in their communities. 
you know, because I'm really all I'm doing is guiding women through the process with the gifts that were handed down to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in that it, it doesn't stop with me, but you now have that same magic. And anybody that comes through the door will be able to use that same magic to heal their communities. And just like you're sharing your healing process, it gives them permission to do their healing process. So it's a really beautiful transference of like the healing process because not only am I a healer, but now you're a healer. And that's how it started. You know, my lineage started way back when and they got to hand it down through the generations. And some of it did get a little diluted because of the generational gap, but it's still there. And I get to pull from that. And when I'm in session and I call to them, Everybody can feel the room gets a little bit denser. They stand by my side. When I call to them, they come. When I lay hands on somebody's womb, they lay hands on somebody's womb. It helps to pull all of that out because they have the knowledge. They know where it came. They know exactly where it came from. So they can really dive deep and they can pull it all out to the surface so that everybody can see like, this is what we need to heal. This is how we heal. This doesn't belong to you anymore. Let it go. Mm -hmm. for, for me, it really hurts to see almost like an appropriation of that kind of healing. And it makes me tear up now even thinking about it because there are so many women out there who need the kind of healing and it's, you know, not only is this, is it being appropriated, but it's being used in a manner that's just for financial gain. And none of that is, there's no recognition to where the lineage came from. There's no like reappropriation of funds to go back to support that lineage. It's not there. I mean, people even think that my lineage doesn't exist anymore, that it was eradicated. That's hurtful. It's my job to let people know that not only does it, does it exist, but it's still here to help the women in the community. Mm. And for me, that's a really big deal because that's now my responsibility to let people know that not only are we still here, but it exists and it exists for a really great reason. And it shouldn't be diluted in a way that it's being diluted and it shouldn't be manipulated and abused and you know, used in a fashion that doesn't support the community itself that it came from. Mm -hmm. in, in reality, a shaman takes lifetime of work. You know, you should be studying under an actual shaman. And when that shaman gets the sign that it's time to pass on the torch, that's a shaman. But, you know, I use the practices and I use them to my best ability and I use them in a way that I feel honors the actual lineage. In the market, there aren't people that look like me. I have imposter syndrome in a lineage that belongs to me because I don't look like the other people in the community who are doing this same kind of work. And finding a lot of success and right. a lot of followers. Right. right, so for me personally, you know, I take that personal because I feel like I'm being, I'm being attacked. But the way that the community is going, I should not have to feel imposter syndrome doing the kind of work that I'm doing with the lineage that I have that backs me in that. My job here, my purpose is to help open women up, to wake them up to the people that they were born to be so that we can start changing the world in a way that's conducive to future generations. You're the break in the chain for the women who come after you. You get to be the example. You get to be, you know, the show of how women can be living and that we don't have to live in this box with these houses, with these cars and doing all these things and feeling, checking out all these boxes and still not feeling like we're happy. You know, there's an alternative method to life. Were you always called to be into this job? Like, did your family support you in this journey of of being, being a, a healer, a rebirther. Like with most Puerto Ricans, you know, we're told that when you graduate high school, you don't go to college, you go clean somebody's house or you work in a warehouse. And that's the family business, like that's what you do. So I that never sat well with me and I didn't know what I quite needed to be doing, but I knew it wasn't that. Um, so I ended up going into finance. It still didn't feel well, but I was doing something that wasn't the two alternatives. And then after having my second birth, I realized that, you know, women started to, women needed to be healed in a way that wasn't being offered at that time. And that was my spark. Mm. And through that, I spent the next 12 years making sure that that's what I did for people. And that felt good. Mm. And it was satisfying. It was gratifying. And I could see the immediate effect on the women that I was working with. So, you know, initially when you try and go against the grain, you get a lot of backlash. Like, how dare you? What makes you think you can do it? You know, this is what we do in our family. You know, what makes you think that you can pull this off? Because again, you know, what I was wanting to do, nobody looked like there wasn't, this space didn't exist in that market. And, you know, it was always, um, but we, what they would say is like, oh, that, that's a white thing. Like, oh, it's a white thing. That's a white career. That's a white life. That's a white, blah, 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 blah. 
Um, but even in that, like I was never like white enough to be white, but I was also never like Puerto Rican looking enough to be Puerto Rican. So I always fell into that gray space. So I thought, you know, screw it. I'm going to do my own thing anyway. So let it be this. And I got a lot of pushback. And for years, even after I started this career and I found myself to be successful in it, there was still that whole like, oh, are you still doing that? Mm. Like it was some sort of hobby. So they still had a really hard time grasping that, you know, as as a Hispanic community, that there was something different for us. And you're already fighting your own imposter syndrome. Right. And where did you find the, this, no, no, this is what I am here to do. It was a lot of the no's. Mm -hmm. Every time I heard the no, you can't do that, that pushed me to wonder why, like, why can't I do it? And it wasn't until, you know, I had my second Owen, where I had all of these things come up for me that nobody could help me with, you know, that was sort of like the final break where I was just like, okay, this is, this is the kind of healing that needs to be offered. And then all of a sudden there was sort of like this, okay, we're supposed to, like, this is us. Nobody's doing it. Why can't we do it for them? All of my examples, they all heard the no's and they stopped at no. Mm. And I saw the kind of lives that they were living and they weren't bad lives. I just didn't want it to be my life. And I owe it not just to myself, but to, you know, anybody else who's living in the Hispanic community that wants a good yes but needs to find it outside of like the community. So, you know, unfortunately in times we have to be our own yes and that was my yes. And it was really scary and I thought most of the time this isn't going to work, but I kept pushing anyway. And so in a lot of ways I kept using my fear as a compass. Okay, this is really scary. You know, I'm gonna do it anyway and see what happens. When I went into this, you know, I was divorcing, single mom of two, and it's still like the fears were there, but I, I knew that this is where I needed to be. This is where my spirit was being called. This is what I knew I needed to be the example for. How long have you owned your own company? It's been 12 years now. This is year 12. Uh, I would deem that very successful, <laughs> even if you stopped your business today. Right. 12 years is a very successful career as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. But as you look back on that, um, what, what do you wish you had when you were a younger little girl Puerto Rican, seeing around you what you saw mm -hmm. that you said, and I think this is really important, great lives, happy lives, mm -hmm. successful lives, but not what you wanted. Right. What did you need back then? I would have done really well to see somebody who looked like me doing more than the warehouse work. That, you know, the community that I was raised in was primarily Hispanic and black. And in those communities, people came in to do good there was never anybody like already being the example. So we never had a face to tie success to. Mm. And I think for me that would have been really big because if I had that earlier on, I probably would have been doing this a lot sooner mm. um, because there weren't any mentors. There, there wasn't somebody who could hold my hand through the process and say, you can do this, like you've got this. You know, I had to, I had to be that person for myself. I had to be a lot of people for myself. And if there was somebody from the get-go who was that voice, who was that face, I think that I would have been able to find my spark a lot sooner and I would have been more confident in that and I would have taken even bigger risks and I would have been even further along. But, you know, even with the, with the absence of that, I'm still happy that I landed where that I did, where I did, the way that I did, when I did. We're getting a lot more socially conscious about right. <laughs> appropriation and about um, seeing success in all forms of diversity and uh -huh. backgrounds. Um, but I haven't heard a lot of discussion about the appropriation in your field. That's really important. It's to figure out like, what kind of business is this person running? Is it a business or is it a practice? So a lot of it goes into their training. Who did they study under? You know, a lot of times people take a weekend course and all of a sudden they're a healer. I'm a healer. Um, I think that's great. If you feel like you're, you're doing great work, then I think that's wonderful. But I don't think that people should be classifying themselves as shamans uh, because that's a pretty hefty title over a weekend course. Mm. You know, it, it takes a lifetime of study to get there. And I think that's the biggest piece is to figure out what lineage did they start under? Are they supporting the lineage that they are, you know, using the, this education from? You know, there are a lot of courses out there, and I, I'm not going to name them, but there are a lot of courses out there who have stolen a lot of the, these cultural rituals and healing, and they renamed it, they repackaged it, and they're making millions of dollars. Never help, never using any of that, you know, financial status to help 
you know, restore financial security back to the community that they took it from. And a lot of that can be found online. It's really easy to find it if you do, but there, if you, most people will have that information on their about me mm -hmm. um, and then do further research in their about me. If somebody is studying under a certain uh, theology, I guess is the best way to put it, um, that they're also recognizing the community in their practice in which that theology came from. Yeah. Well, and we as consumers, I hope, are by and large moving to a more responsible investment with their dollars, right. especially coming out of COVID. And we want mm -hmm. the businesses that we love to stay open. Right. Um, we should be more responsible and intentional with our money. And so, right. you know, one thing that's beautiful about you is anyone who knows you knows you eat, breathe and sleep and live this healing philosophy, these mm -hmm. the rebirthing of women um, practice. You, it, it is your life. It's yeah. not a, it's not <laughs> even a nine to five. It's your life. And right. then, just a little bit of a question, a few questions later, we learn where this comes from and what it means to you and how it is right. so embedded into your genetics. Right. Um, and I think that sets you apart from a lot of, of the competition. And anyone who has what you have is going to share that right. because they're proud of it and because mm -hmm. they know that that is a major part of why they're successful yeah. in the healing and, and yeah. in that transfer of energy. So mm -hmm. what did you want to be when you grew up? When you were little... Did you oh, have the gosh. dreams of being a cashier like everybody? <laughs> I think every girl <laughs> wanted to dink, dink. <laughs> I did. And way back then, it was like you had to push the numbers. And I was in such it. awe. Like, they, couldn't, they didn't have to look. So I definitely had the little cash register and did that. But um, at the time, I was doing dancing. Mm -hmm. And dancing was a really great exp expression for me. Uh, and where, living where I lived, there were a lot of like inner city dance companies. And so I did that for a really, really long time. Um, well, and, that, and your dancing took you on cruise lines. Like it did. you were, you were <laughs> dancing, dancing. Yeah, I was. I danced for uh, Universal, Disney, and then for uh, Warner Brothers, uh, and Premier Cruise Lines, which is now like a, another company owns everything. It's Carnival. You know, this was all training. Like I was, I was constantly being trained in the dancing. I was constantly being in my body. Like I was being trained how to be in my body, how to move my body, how to live into my body, how to express my through my body. Um, and I use that a lot of times today with women and getting to getting them to free the emotion through movement. Like I help women move their bodies so that they can loosen their hips so that they can start to feel safe and secure and sexual. You know, I help them move their upper bodies so that they can feel forceful and powerful and you know strong. And so like all of these things were all very connected. And I didn't know what it was leading up to. But now that I see it, it's like, oh, it's so apparent. Like, how did I not know that this was what was happening? The universe was getting me ready for you know who I was about to be, um, and then the financial piece happened. And it was like, well, you know, she took a sidestep. <laughs> <laughs> it was a sidestep, and it's okay. You know, I like the people that I worked with, but it was a really great lesson where I didn't need to be. You know, that was me doing the things that I thought I was supposed to be doing to support my family, to like own the house, to be own successful. the car, right? And what the outward like rule book says you're supposed to have to live a happy life, but I still wasn't happy. I had a heart attack at 28. Um, stress-based you know it was just a lot and you know I was in an unhappy marital situation so that all of these stresses compounded you know and it was a wake-up call for me and mm -hmm. from that point on I had to figure out okay so what do I do to start living the kind of life that is not going to make this happen again today I get to wake up every morning and know like this is part of my story that's gonna help and heal somebody else mm -hmm. and I think that's that's really strong for women because that's how we relate to each other is through story and, you know, tribes past, that's how they related. They told stories and that's how they knew, like, I'm going to survive this next thing to come. If a bear is coming towards me, like somebody has run from this bear and figured out how to run from the bear to stay alive. So this is, you know, through the stories that we tell, um, we give other women permission to tell their stories, to make, to normalize the things that happen to us mm -hmm. as women so that we can heal through it and not wear it as like a source of shame or fear. And you just glazed over a stress-based heart attack at 28 like it was nothing. <laughs> <Like> chapter <laughs> closed. I'm like, wait. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That, um, but it, you know, I'm sure when that happened, it was the most monumental thing you had gone through at that mm -hmm. point. Um, but what an incredible bit of um, experience for you to now be able to turn to, to talk right. to women and say, stop living this supposed to life. Right. And like, your life is good, mm -hmm. but you know, is that really yeah. what you want? You know, right? Because some people walk around and they're like, "Well, my life isn't bad," and that's how they justify it. Well, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. Okay, but bad's not good. It not being bad doesn't make it good. 
And good's not great, and great's not legendary. At this point in my life, I believe that not only do you, I deserve legendary, but so does everybody else. You know, I just want to like shake the shit out of some women who are like, oh, it's not bad. It doesn't make it good. <laughs> not yeah. being bad should not be the marker for being happy or okay with where you're at. Yeah, absolutely. And when you look back on yourself as a little girl, do you see your traits as a little girl that <laughs> showed you this is what you were going to do when you were growing up? I think in some ways, yes. I think it was more of the rebellious side that, that kept popping up because <laughs> I was always in trouble. Always in trouble. <laughs> I was always doing something that I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> that's supposed to <laughs> showed up. Right, that's supposed to <laughs> show up. I remember when I was in fifth grade, my music teacher told me that my embouchure, my mouth would, my lips were too big to play French horn. So in sixth grade, what did I do? I picked the French horn and I <laughs> nailed it, nailed it. What kind of teacher says that? Anyway, why do we have these stories of horrible teachers giving us baggage, mental right. baggage? And I carried grade. that and I was just like, watch me. Yeah. And, that was, and when I look back and I just recently started having this conversation with my mom, I didn't realize how much a rebel I was. And then I started going through all these stories. And I was like, oh, shit, I've always been the white sheep of my family <laughs> because they're all really dark and I'm the lightest one. So I'm, I'm obviously the white sheep. <laughs> I was going to say the white sheep. <laughs> I like so, that. I like that. So, yeah, so I've always, that's been the, the one consistent. Yeah. And I think, you know, in that, again, that, that was the prep. Like that was my growing strength in knowing that I wasn't going to do what was laid out for me. Like the family business, almost, you know, I, I wasn't going to fall into that. And I didn't know what I was necessarily going to fall into, but I knew at some point I was going to find it and it was going to be great. Yeah. I knew that I had gifts because uh, my great-grandmother always worked with me on those gifts. She always told me that they were there. She supported them. Uh, no matter how scary they got, she always supported that. And after she passed away, I didn't realize how often she was there, mm. but she was. I didn't know what I was feeling or experiencing until I got older, and then I realized she was there the whole time. She was the one holding my hand. She was the one guiding me. She was telling me that it was okay because she was a rebel because she constantly lived into who she was. And she did it without apology. She yeah. did it without apology. And for me, that was such a great lesson because she was the only one in my life who was doing that. Yeah. Like, it's okay to be, like, in your space, but it's, it's also okay to want more. You said something about your great-grandmother that um, sparked something in me that I think about you. Um, women who are unapologetic women who are doing what they're called to do, who they are supposed to be, are beautiful. And they glow, and they're fiery, and and they're magnetic. Mm -hmm. And you can't hide it. And, right. and it's so scary for people to see it because they see it coming a mile away. Uh -huh. But at the same time, people are so attracted to it. Everybody yeah. wants to be around that fire. Everybody mm -hmm. wants that warmth. Everybody wants some of it. Right. Um, they either want some of it or they don't want you to have as much. But mm -hmm. um, you know, women like you who stand so boldly and bravely, no matter how scary it is, just emanate that energy and yeah. that magic and that beauty and that fire, the way you described your great-grandmother. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you shared energy, magic, <laughs> fire, all of it. I wish people could be here to actually feel how it feels and how real and raw it is. Um, so in the video cast and on the podcast, we will link all of your social media so people listening and watching can connect with you. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't say enough about how valuable you are, how you've changed my life. You've changed so many women around me's lives. Um, and I do appreciate you speaking about the importance of recognizing appropriation in your industry um, and how we can intentionally use our dollars to support people such as yourself and other healers who legitimately come from, mm -hmm. you know, um, a family lineage, a culture of healing right. um, and care work. Uh, so that way we can we can do better because we should all be able to, to do better with that. So thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> With every woman who shares her story here on the She Dreams in Color video series, we like to choose a t-shirt and a company that will really amplify the obstacles she talked about. And today Angie talked about um, not loving herself as she showed up in her industry because she didn't see other women like her. So we chose this shirt from the self-love movement from the company Sisterhood Designs and it's called, it says, Love Yourself First. Sisterhood Designs is owned by twins who are 19 years old. They have this whole self-love movement of t-shirt designs where you can choose something that really reminds us that we should love ourselves first and show up authentically. It's our turn. 